I'm going to uh, address uh, data integrity issues. Uh, I think that's not talked about enough. And then uh, go on to uh, address in what little time we have, natural variability and climate change. Um, I'll talk about the global surface databases, uh, how they suffer from serious issues that produce a warm bias and render them, I believe, useless for an accurate trend analysis. Uh, I agree uh, with Dennis that temperatures have begun to decline that are negatively correlated with CO2 and that the oceans and the sun and volcanism on a shorter term correlate far better with temperatures, including the recent cooling. The global database issues, and I won't have time to talk about all of these, we'll pick a few, but uh, station dropout is a big one. Two thirds of the world's stations dropped out around 1990, especially the rural. The missing monthly data increased tenfold about that time. Uh, urban adjustment is not made on the global database or where it is, it's totally inadequate. The world population has increased from 1.5 to 6.7 billion since 1900. Citing for a, a vast majority of observing sites don't meet standards, as Anthony Watts has shown so well. Uh, we had instruments problems, that uh, the instruments that had a warm bias that were not corrected for. And the ASOS uh, instruments, the automated observing uh, station uh, instruments were designed by the FAA for aviation. They cared about wind and visibility and thunder and not temperature. And the tolerance for accuracy is plus or minus 0.9 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and then there's manual or black box adjustments with no visibility for quality control or validation by outside sources. And then there's the problems in the ocean that are vast and the oceans cover 70% of the globe and uh, we don't know how to uh, uh, deal with major data gaps and, and adjust for changing measurement. How can we ever hope to, to detect uh, trends to a precision of a tenth of a degree with all of those issues? Here's an example of the station dropout chart. This is a plot of all of the stations in the NOAA database. And you'll, in the blue, you see the big drop off around 1990 and the average temperature jumped at the same time. Uh, Jonathan Drake uh, broke it up into urban, suburban, and rural. And you can see the number of rural stations dropped dramatically at that time, as did uh, to a lesser degree the urban and suburban. At the same time, temperatures rose dramatically. This suggests a distribution issue suggest that more, most of the stations that closed were cooler uh, uh, rural uh, stations and uh, the resulting warming that took place was not, not real. It was a, uh, a data distribution issue. Here's an example of April 18, 1978. Uh, NASA uh, with 250 kilometer smoothing showing good coverage of the continents. Uh, this is the same in April 2008. Notice Canada is missing and Africa and Brazil a good part of Russia. Um, the number of missing months also increased dramatically. This was from McKittrick and Michaels in the early uh, 1990s, especially in the former Soviet Union. This is an example of what that looks like. The 999.9s are all missing months. And this creates, a, creates an opportunity for mischief the, among the data basers. Uh, we've got the urban heat island. No one d denies that man has a major influ influence locally on, on the climate uh, in the urban heat island. Uh, more and more of the world is urbanized. Cities grow around the airports where we measure temperatures. Now, peer review is very clear and very extensive. Just a few examples. Oki, back in 73, following Landsberg, suggested even small towns can have a significant warming of a three degree Fahrenheit, a uh, town of 1,000 in winter. Uh, and there are other uh, examples, zoo showing that global databases for China and block for Europe were not adequate, Hinkle for Alaska. Insufficient adjustments introduces a warm bias to the data. Goodrich in California showed that counties in California with over a million population had a warming of four degrees Fahrenheit from 1915 to 95. Counties between 100,000 and a million, one degree. Counties with less than 100,000 population, no warming. Now, what do the data centers do with uh, UHI? Well, NCDC removed the UHI adjustment that Carl put in in 1988 and the first USHEN version in 1990 uh, in version two in 2007. NOAA, in their global database and Hadley, don't specifically adjust for UHI because they don't have the metadata, the siting and population information they need to make the decisions as to what to, how to adjust. 
Instead, they apply a 0.05 to 0.1 degrees Celsius uncertainty per century to the data. Now, JIST applies a satellite-based UHI adjustment to USHCN and attempts a global database, but without the good population data, McIntyre's found their adjustments for global urban areas are as often up as they are down. So um, not uh, solving that issue on a global basis. Instead, USHCN, uh, instead of the uh, uh, urban heat island adjustment, replaces it with a change point algorithm. It's an, uh, it's an algorithm that looks for a sudden discontinuity in temperature that implies uh, a site move uh, or major la land, local land use change. Now, it can't be expected to find the slow ramp up of temperatures so associated with urban growth or gradual land use changes. Uh, for example, uh, it might, uh, it should pick up uh, uh, this jump in temperature in Tahoe City, California, when they decided to put a tennis court around an observing station and a trash burn bow within five feet of the, of the shelter, and the temperatures jumped, but it would not pick up the suburban growth uh, warming and, and to a, a slow uh, increase in population in places like Sacramento. I took a difference between the USHCN version two and the GIST US adjusted data, uh, which does take UHI in effect, and I find that NOAA has introduced a warming uh, to the removal of the UHI adjustment of 0.75 degrees Fahrenheit since 1930s. Um, there's proof of man-made global warming, but the men are in Asheville. <laughs> now, there are widespread sighting issues. Uh, Pielke started this uh, as showing Hopkinsville, Kentucky, very well uh, known, uh, the old uh, Weber grill uh, photo, uh, thermometer over the Weber grill next to the bush and on driveway, the Davies uh, thermometer near the building and near the air conditioner exhaust. Uh, Tucson, Arizona, in the parking lot on the paved driveway. Uh, Anthony is 75% uh, uh, through the data, the stations now, but when he was 75%, uh, 70% as of the 11th of uh, February, uh, only 11% of the stations, the 841 uh, uh, stations that uh, he had looked at, uh, met the standards. That means 89% failed. And you can see most of the country uh, were rated poor. That's the yellow, oranges, and red. And only scattered areas had good sighting. There's numerous peer review papers ignored by the IPCC and the data centers that have estimated these problems can account for half the warming since 1880. And even with that, uh, those errors, there's not much warming in the NASA U.S. data. Uh, only, as uh, Dennis pointed out, about two-tenths of a degree Fahrenheit since 1930. Uh, 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 there's a cyclical change there. But how good is that? Well, take Anthony's Limpasas, Texas analysis. Uh, they moved from a park-like area in the city to the street side location in 2000, and you see a big jump in the, in the temperatures about that time. Um, the NASA homogeneity adjustment uh, didn't catch that, but wound up cooling off the 1930s and 20s and teens, increasing the global warming, not decreasing it. Uh, and what really was, as you can see, up until they, they moved that station, a recent cooling trend. The 1930s shows up in the record highs. This, Des Moines, Iowa is a continental climate in the middle of the country. Uh, 33 of the record highs in June and July were set in the 1930s, five in 1988, none since. The same thing for the record highs by state. Uh, 24 were set in the 1930s, uh, and 37 of the 50 before the 1960s, suggesting that the recent warming is not as great as uh, the warming we experienced in the middle 30s. Here's the Had Hadley data, and you can see the uh, 0.45 uh, degree Fahrenheit warming, quarter degree, but if, if half of that is, uh, is exaggeration because of no HI, UHI adjustment, we're back down to that point too uh, that he talked about. And you might as well substitute temperature with population as your y-axis because that's what we're seeing, the, ur you know, ur the uh, population 
uh, is uh, one of the key factors, not the only one. We'll talk about the others in a minute. Uh, worldwide uh, record high temperatures on a continent by continent basis also show uh, Africa, 1922, 1913, 42, 1889, 1881, 1905, 1912, 1974, no recent continental warm. You can see in the uh, temperatures in the USHDN, that warming uh, Dennis talked about in the teens to the 30s, the cooling to the 70s, a warming, and then the cooling again up and down, uh, even as CO2 rose. There's five of the last seven decades that I've seen cooling since World War II in the post-war uh, World War II uh, boom. Uh, it doesn't sound like a great endorsement for CO2 as the primary climate driver, 42 of the 70 years, according to Richard Courtney in the global database. In the uh, global databases, uh, the satellite and the, and the Hadley, you can see a declining temperature and a negative correlation with the uh, CO2, which is shown in green here. The Hadley in purple and the blue is the um, University of Alabama data. What's, what are the natural cycles that are, are driving the climate? There's the ocean, the sun, and volcanism. Uh, with the recent cooling, they had to come up with an excuse, and uh, the UK Met Office mentioned, uh, well, El Nino and La Niñas are important and do have a significant effect on global surface temperature. In a rare moment of reasonableness, Hansen in 1999 said, we suggest that further warming in the United Sta States to a level rivaling the 1930s is likely in the next decade, but reliable prediction requires better understanding of decadal oscillations of ocean temperatures. And you know the La Nina and the El Nino uh, typical patterns uh, with, you'll notice at the bottom, more tendency for, for cold and wet in, in La Nina in many areas and warm and dry in El Ninos. Uh, the El Nino and the Pacific decadal oscillation are tied very closely to get a, together as uh, Dennis mentioned. You'll notice the Pacific pattern with El Nino and La Nina look a lot like the, the uh, pattern in the basin-wide uh, Pacific decadal oscillation, the positive phase being uh, similar to the El Nino, the negative phase to the La Nina. And you see that 30 year, at least in the last century, 30 year uh, cycle of the PDO. Uh, we, we were coming out of the warm phase and now have turned back into the cold phase. And you can see with that, when you look at the El Nino show up, you see how well the PDO and, and that multivariate ENSO index change together uh, in unison and reinforce each other. The Atlantic also has a decadal oscillation called the AMO, the Atlantic Multi-Decadal Oscillation. It's about 60 to 70 years. We recently turned warm in uh, 1995. That allowed Bill Gray to predict the more active hurricane seasons. Uh, when the Atlantic warms, uh, it warms in the tropics, but it also warms in the far north Atlantic. But notice that when the AMO is positive, the correlation is uh, for warmth in most of the uh, continents in the northern hemisphere, cold southern oceans. And uh, since uh, uh, that is a significant, uh, statistic, uh, statistically significant in places, it's a very, uh, it's a tripole-like pattern with warm in the north, cool in the middle, and warm in the south in, in the Atlantic. Now, if the AMO induces, uh, when it's in a positive mode, warming, a negative mode, the opposite, cooling, and the PDO induces El Ninos, which bring warming when it's positive and negative, cooling, if you add the two together, uh, they ought to, provide a, a decent correlation with uh, temperatures. Uh, well, I, I looked at the US temperatures here, and you see how well the, the AMO plus P, uh, PDO uh, uh, correlates with the US temperatures over the last century. Major volcanic eruptions play a role too, as was uh, mentioned uh, uh, by Harrison uh, Schmidt at lunch. Uh, you see the big eruptions in the early 80s and 90s produced uh, several years of cooling. Notice the very low level of volcanic ash activity and, and sulfate aerosols in the uh, early 2000s. And that may have contributed to some of the warmth that you see at the top in the satellite data in the, uh, this, uh, this past decade. If uh, a high degree of uh, sulfate aerosols means more reflection of radiation, less aerosols mean more radiation getting through. I did a correlation of the stratospheric aerosols with uh, global temperatures. And I found when it was more than a half a standard deviation above, more aerosols after vol major volcanic eruptions that we see uh, widespread cooling, especially in the polar regions. You'll see other cycles in there. You'll see 106 in the 213 year cycle. The beginning of each of the last four centuries, uh, th three centuries has been cold, uh, quieter sun, colder sun. 
uh, and that would suggest that perhaps we are headed for a colder sun in the early part of this century. There's a 213 year cycle that would take us back to the Dalton minimum like conditions and we'll see if that's a possibility in a second. Now the sun has uh, direct effects, the changes in solar brightness or radiance is relatively small, 0.1. Uh, percent in the 11-year cycle, but it's larger on the, uh, uh, you know, in the longer term. Uh, but it's magnified by the indirect effects, things like ultraviolet, which changes 6 to 8 percent in the 11-year cycle, and it causes ozone chemistry high up in low and mid latitudes, as shown in a data by Lebitsky in models by Schindel, who says he, he, he uh, can explain the modern minimum with, with the UV alone. Uh, active Sun also reduces low cloudiness by diffusing galactic uh, cloud forming cosmic rays, the Svensmark effect, as was mentioned. Uh, Scafetta and West uh, suggest that using the total solar radiance as a proxy for the total solar effect, since the, usually when the sun is more active, it's not only more uh, brighter, but there's more UV and, and less uh, cosmic rays and less, less cloudiness and leads to warming. And he said it might account for 69% of the changes since 1900. I, I did that uh, smoothing. I found about a 0.64 with a little bit of a three-year lag versus the TSI for the U.S. running mean temperatures. When you look at the uh, TSI and the PDO and AMO cycles together, we're somewhat similar to what we were in the early 1960s, and the climate, the weather this last uh, year or so has been very similar to the early 1960s. Uh, and if I add temperature to that, you see how well temperature correlates with the sun and the ocean cycles. Uh, now this sunspot cycle has been unusually long. It's, uh, it's 12 years, five months, absolute minimum. It could be longer, it could be as much as 13. We've had a lot of sunspot list days. Last, uh, last year there were 266, 564 so far this transition. It looks like we're gonna go over 600. 2007, this is the, the, the most, this is the last century here. You see we had the second most in 2008. We were, 2007 made the list. It looks like 2009 is probably gonna make this list of the top 10. Uh, as well. Uh, also, the, the cycle uh, w could be as long as 13 years. There's a lot of similarity between the s last four cycles and the uh, cycles in the late 1700s, uh, which would take us to uh, uh, the Dalton minimum. Now, Chris Christensen had noticed uh, a very strong correlation of temperature with uh, solar cycle length, but in a recent paper had, cons had concerned that temperatures seem to be diverging from that and perhaps that was a sign of the greenhouse effect finally kicking in. However, I think it's the evidence that the global databases are contaminated. Work the other way around. And uh, this is a clibard, one of the model, uh, a statistical model of solar activity and he sees uh, solar activity in the upcoming decades, much like the early 1800s, the time of Dickens uh, with snow in London which we saw it in several times this, this year, uh, rather regular. And uh, so in summary, temperature trends are exaggerated by many issues, most notably urbanization and siting, warming in recent decades uh, smaller than assumed and are of a cyclical nature, and natural cycles in the sun and ocean correlate far better with temperatures than CO2 and the quiet sun and ocean cooling going on. Uh, PDOs turned uh, cold. The AMOs actually turned slightly negative. Uh, that suggests cooling, not warming, in our future. Now, it may only last a few decades. Uh, after the early 1800s, it warmed again in the middle 1800s, and then it's maybe exactly right. But uh, for a few decades, we may see cooling, an interruption of, of uh, recent warming, uh, a cooling rather than, than uh, acceleration of global warming. Thank you. Thank you.